You have a photon that popped into existence and splits into an electron positron pair. Usually, those pairs will annihilate back into the photon, and the photon then, di then disappears from existence. But sometimes, if there's a black hole in the, in the middle of nowhere, it will suck one of those particles in, say an electron, and the, and the positron is left with no best friend. As a result, the positron has, th has nothing to annihilate with, so it, it stays existing. This will violate pretty much every conservation law in physics, since a thing just popped from into existence from nowhere and just kept on existing. So as a result, the black hole has to lose some of its mass and energy to cancel out the mass and energy the positron has. It loses this energy in the form of Hawking radiation, and voila, that's how, that's how Hawking, Hawking radiation works. One small problem. That's absolutely incorrect. Hawking radiation is described by virtual particles all the time online, especially YouTube. Take this Kurtzset video, for example. Empty space is not really empty, but filled with virtual particles popping into existence and annihilating each other again. When this happens right on the edge of a black hole, one of the virtual particles will be drawn into the black hole, and the other will escape and become a real particle. They all use the same 100% incorrect ex ex explanation for Hawking radiation. Virtual particles can't be used to explain Hawking radiation because they don't represent real physical prop particles. Instead, they re represent what's called the propagator, which, which is a mathematical expression used in some in interesting Feynman diagrams. I haven't seen any video on YouTube that describes Hawking radiation correctly in mathematical detail, so I guess I'll be the first. If virtual particles don't cause Hawking radiation, then... How does Hawking radiation work? To understand this, we need to learn quantum field theory. I've already made like 10 videos on quantum field theory, and I highly recommend check checking those out if you want to get the most out of this video. I haven't covered all the topics that I'm, I'm, that I'm going to introduce yet, so I will be simplifying some things a bit. So you know that in quantum field theory, there are these special, special things called quantum fields. Here's the formula for a free scalar field. We see that the field is the superposition of plane waves. Plane waves are just sinusoidal functions. The other, the other reason why the quantum field is a wave. The coefficients in front of the plane waves just tells us how much of the, of the plane waves make up our entire field. And these coefficients depend on the momentum of the field, labeled k. This equation is pretty big, big already, so let's use some s simplifying notation. Let's change our integral sign to a summation, since integrals are really just continuous summations. Let's denote the, pl the plane wave scaled by the Fourier factor with the, with the letter phi. And let's put the momentum dependence of the coefficients as a subscript. This is abuse of notation, since we have the same symbol representing the, the, total, the total field and the plane waves. But to make it clear which one is which, we will not use a, a, a subscript k for the total field. We now obtain this new sim simplified equation. If you're confused, don't worry. Quantum field theory isn't, isn't exactly a walk in the park. It's more like a sprint through, through an avalanche. The main idea here is that our field can be decomposed into other components called modes, which we add together to get the total field. Just like how three can be split up into three parts. The coefficients in front of our plane waves have special names, by the way. They're called the annihilation and creation operators, respectively. It turns out that these operators help tell us the number of particles in our system. In quantum field theory, to find the number of particles in a system, we multiply the number operator by the state vector. The state vector encodes pro probabilities of finding certain things. They're basically the wave function of, quant of quantum field theory. When we, when we multiply the number operator by the state vector, we will get a scalar quantity multiplied by the state vector, called an eigenvalue. The eigenvalue tells us the number of particles in our system. The formula for the number operator is just the product of the creation and, and annihilation operators. Keep this in mind.
Now we know from relativity that things can look different from different frames of reference, like energy and velocity. The frame of reference is really just a coordinate system, and we see that our field depends on quantities like position and momentum, which will, which will look different in different coordinate systems. This means that the formula for our field may sometimes look different in different coordinate systems as well. It turns out that for Minkowski spacetime, which is flat spacetime, our field always looks the same when we change coordinates, but the story changes in curved spacetime. In curved spacetime, sp specifically that around a black hole, our field looks different, so, so we denote, denote the new plane waves and coefficients by a tilde sign. Remember when we said that the number operator is the product of the creation and annihilation operator? Well, since the creation and annihilation operator changes in curved spacetime, that means that the number operator will also change in a curved spacetime. Since the number operator tells us how many particles are in our system, this means that the formula for the number of particles that some observer will use will change in curved spacetime. And hence, the number of particles that count in the system will change as well. This essentially boils down to saying that an observer in flat space will disagree with an observer in curved space about the number of particles in a system. An observer in flat space may see zero, while an observer in curved space sees 10. The extra particles that the observer in curved space sees is called, drum roll, Hawking radiation. To make this more explicit, we can write out the creation and annihilation operators in curved space as a linear combination of the creation and annihilation operators in flat space. These transformations, transformations we obtain between the old flat bases and the new curved bases are called the Bokoyubov transformation. Say that, say, that, say that five times fast. We can take the expansion value of the number operator in the vacuum state in curved space, which tells us how many particles an observer in curved space will see in what a flat space observer, observer would call a vacuum. Just as we expected, the number of particles we get is not zero, meaning that when a flat space observer sees zero particles, for a curved space observer, there will be there will be, be particles measured, and the number of particles is equal to beta squared. In fact, for Hawking radiation, the beta squared value is, is proportional to a quantity that, that relates to the temperature of, of a black hole, implying that, that the extra particles seen Increase, increase, increases the temperature of a system. So we now see that Hawking radiation isn't caused by virtual particles popping into existence. Instead, they are caused by the observers in flat space and curved space using different formulas for the number of particles. Now you may believe that this video is just one large waste of time, because since virtual particles are just a simplification, we, we shouldn't be too fussed about the about this simplified explanation not being completely correct. Now, while I do agree that this video is a waste of time, I should really be studying for my AP exams right now. What must be understood is that, is that the virtual particle picture is absolutely incorrect and does not describe Hawking radiation at all. It is just as correct as saying that a magical lobster on Neptune uses their magical lobster powers to cause Hawking radiation. Explaining Hawking radiation with, with virtual particles only makes things more, more confusing, in my opinion, and the real explanation is much simpler in a way. Complex phenomena are like a crazy knot tied through itself multiple times. All it takes is finding the right string, and the entire thing comes loose to a sim simplified string. All it takes is finding the right expa explanation to make, it, to make a complex topic simple. Thanks for watching.